So what's up on the screen is our uh, schematic diagram, Advancing the Kingdom, Resisting the Enemy. It's a study of the book of Acts. It's not a sequential study. The intention of it is to look at the advancement of the kingdom in the book of Acts and the flow, uh, there was an advancement, there was resistance. There was advancement, there was resistance. You can look at the book of Acts and you can say, that's just a history of the early church. That was for then, it was a temporary time period. You could look at the book of Acts and say, okay, this is the first shot out of the gun. Actually, we're going to come back to those days, to uh, the perfected worldwide expression of those things. So we're just seeing what the church was supposed to be like. And those who were trained directly by Jesus, how did they approach church and life and so on, which is the view that I take. And everything that was available to them is available to us and we'll need it. They were living in times of tremendous opposition, uh, Roman control, and Jerusalem would in not too many years be trampled under totally, and they were dispersed throughout the whole earth. We are obviously moving to a time where it appears like there are many that have as a desire for world domination and control at magnitude that wasn't even dreamed possible back at that time period. If they needed it, we really need all that's available. And um, so that's a perspective, that's my perspective, and I wanted to look at prayer, and uh, so I've entitled this Sunday morning, March 1st, the book of Acts 5, A Functioning House of Prayer. God's calling us to be a house of prayer. It's not a unique calling in that sense. Every church is called to be a house of prayer. Living dependently on God. What is a house of prayer? What do I mean by that? Because to some people that scares some people because they think, oh, so are we going to be turned into an international house of prayer, an IHOP type thing as out in Kansas City and has many expressions. And uh, I want to say, no, not at all. That is a form of a house of prayer. There are many forms. We're a local church. Uh, but primarily, I believe a church is to be a place, a gathering of people who are dependent upon God. They live their lives dependent on God, not living independently. And my hopes are that through the years we've had various labels applied to us. In our earliest years, the thing we began to find out was that people would say about us, well, they're nice people. That was how we were described, the people of New Covenant. They're just nice people. And I don't mind being told, uh, you know, called, labeled a nice person. During the days of renewal, I think we were called strange people. I don't mind being called strange. I would love it at this season of our lives that that's the accusation made against us. Well, those people pray. If you go there, they're going to pray for you. If you have a need, they're going to pray. I would love to have that as an accusation. I think that should be the declaration of every church. Well, that's a gathering of people who are dependent upon God and they pray. That's what I mean by a house of prayer. It's a local church. We're a local church caring for families, caring for people, caring for the different age groups, trying to interact with one another as is in harmony with Scripture. But at its core value, a people who are not living independent lives, they're living dependently upon God. And a major expression of that, not an exclusive, but a major expression of that is that they pray. So I wanted to look at the book of Acts, something I've never really done before, and just focus on, okay, what are all the different kinds and circumstances when they prayed? How did they utilize prayer? Prayer, especially those who were trained by Jesus himself personally, because that'll give you a real good look at it. So, um, and of the promise that I read to you, a prophecy, the purest prophecy, just taking that middle paragraph, trying to bring us back current, and it said, Jamie Galloway back years ago, and this shall, 2006, this shall be a house of prayer, the Lord calls it, and it will be a, the building that God's calling me to build. And it will be a house of prayer, the Lord calls it, and it will be a house of prayer for all nations. And there's an element of being involved in the rebuilding of the temple in Jerusalem. Not just for the nation and other countries, but it will be a house of prayer. The place of prayer so in the next slide, what I'm going to do is, this is going to be, what I'm wanting to take is like bath water and just splash us, me, all of us, with bath, a washing of the word of the place of prayer in the book of Acts. So we'll post these notes uh, on the website, so if you wa want them, because it'll be way too quick. And it's, it's intended just to be a bath, and just look at 
how important, how fundamental was prayer in the New Testament as expressed in the record in the book of Acts. So here we go. Ones that we've covered, Acts 1.14. They prayed while they were waiting. It's a good idea to pray while you're waiting for promises of God. They were waiting when Jesus said, go to Jerusalem and wait till you receive power from on high. So they gathered together. They were unified in praying while they were waiting. 124, they had to replace Judas as a disciple because his life was over. And they prayed. They were going to do it in an unusual way, cast lots. They prayed and asked for God's guidance in the method that they agreed upon. They were at peace with, this is how we're going to make the choice. And they prayed. Acts 2.4, it was corporate prayer in the Spirit. It's why I push this. I believe that the church, at the time of the return of Christ, because I believe those are going to be the most glorious and the darkest days in the earth, I do believe that as it began when the Helper came, the local church would be a place, will be a place, where prayer in the Spirit is a significant element, prayer element in the local church. Not the exclusive prayer element, but a very, very significant element in the church. Acts 2.4, that whole chapter of Acts chapter 2. Prayer is a fundamental part, Acts 2.42. is they prayed, they had apostles teaching, they fellowshiped, uh, they participated in prayer. So uh, it's, it, it was an everyday component. It was a fundamental part. Acts 3, one. they had regular prayer times. Peter and John, they were going to the temple, and that's where the man asked, what, you know, would you, he asked for alms, and uh, they said, well, we don't have any, but what we have we'll give you, and he was healed, and then that started a whole chain of things in reaction. Acts, two, Acts chapter 4, verse 24, and is they were then threatened because the man was healed and that caused all kinds of uproar and the religious establishment didn't like it at all. So they were threatened and so they gathered together and they prayed when they were threatened. So that's what we did early this morning. I believe the, we're being threatened by curses that have been set in motion against us to try and keep us from fulfilling, seeing the fulfillment of God's purposes. They asked for boldness. They asked for signs and wonders. They prayed for that. Those were things they prayed for. We've covered these. Acts 6.4. The leadership said this is a leadership priority for us. Prayer and the ministry of the word, teaching of the word. And uh, more than ever in my life, it's a part of my life, not near like it can be but it's more than ever before. It's a significant part, I believe, for all of us involved in leadership and your own lives. They gave themselves to prayer in the ministry of the Word, 6-6, releasing into ministry. They set in motion in chapter 6, the first, what we call deacons, and when they had picked them, selected them to end, to deal with a church problem, they prayed for them and released them. They were exercising the answer. It was like, the answer is not men. That's not the answer. We have chosen men from different nations, different nationalities, Greek and Hebrew, to deal with this widows who were, some were being neglected. We're, we, you know, we've made wise choices, but we realize, Lord, we are commending them to them. We're asking you to make it come to pass. They were exercising, expressing their dependency upon God as they dealt with organizational matters. You can do that in your own home. You can do that in your work. You can do that. We can do that in the local church. So now, Acts 8.15. So we'll, we're continuing on. That's what we've done bringing you to date. Acts 15, who, when they had come down, uh, as a result of some of the turmoil in Jerusalem and Stephen's death, uh, the, the gospel was spread. Someone had gone to Samaria. Philip had gone to Samaria. And they received Christ, but they hadn't received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Notice how thorough the scripture is, how important it is to receive the baptism in the Holy Spirit. And uh, because when it was released in Jerusalem, they all received. When it was released in, Jama in Samaria, you'll see that they all received. Doesn't say they spoke in tongues, but they all received. When it was released to the Gentiles in Acts chapter 10, they all received, they all spoke in tongues. This is the Acts 8.15, who when they had come down, some of the apostles came from Jerusalem to Samaria because they'd heard they had received Christ but had not yet been filled with the Holy Spirit, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For as yet he had fallen upon none of them. They had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. We believe that the baptism of the Holy Spirit is an additional work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Uh, the original work is regeneration of our hearts. The Holy Spirit comes into us upon accepting Jesus Christ. It's synonymous in my thinking to when Jesus was conceived by the Holy Spirit in the womb of Mary. That was the first work of the Holy Spirit in his life. It was conception. 
very different than ours. Yet at the same time, it pictured ours being born again, his being conceived. But that was not the totality of all of the work of the Holy Spirit in the life of Jesus. When he was 30 and ready to step into ministry, he received how God anointed him, Acts 10.38 says, how God anointed him with the Holy Spirit and with power who went about doing good, healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. And the scripture is crystal clear in the verses before that it happened when he was baptized by John. So in Jesus' own life, from my perspective, everything of God that he had did not come to him at the time of conception. And nobody other than he has had that conception. But it still wasn't sufficient. Meaning, there was more that God in his will, in his planning, in his foreknowledge, in the way he is setting in motion, there was more for Jesus, there's more for us. And that is to be, filled with the, to be born of the Spirit, to be filled with the Spirit, enabling you to fulfill the calling that's on your life. So I have labeled this, the third one, 815, prayer for release of the Holy Spirit. It's a valid thing to pray for. Next instance in Acts, Acts 8.22. Simon, a musician, saw it. It wasn't healing because there, was there were major healings in Samaria. Acts chapter 8 talks about. But when those two apostles came and laid their hands on people and the Holy Spirit came on them, what happened? I don't know. Did tongues of fire come on them as it did on the day of Pentecost? Maybe. We don't know. Did they all speak in tongues? I think so but it can't be proven by the text that is given to us. But something happened in addition to healings that Simon the magician said, I want to buy that power. So uh, the, Peter's response to him was, repent therefore of this your wickedness and pray God if perhaps the thought of your heart may be forgiven you. So you come upon a time period where you realize, I'm wrong. I need to repent. That's time to pray. I've messed up here. I shouldn't have done that. I'm not saying it's going to be identical to, uh, to what Simon did on that day, pray for the ability, the, uh, the, the anointing to be able to lay hands on people, and they do whatever happened that day in Samaria. But when you recognize, I'm wrong, I've been wrong, pray. So I'm labeled this A22, prayer for repentance. This should be a place. I've heard of recently, I won't document any more of someone has documented to me, someone their life was just the way they were living, wasn't right. Uh, and they've come here, and as a result of being here and God moving and working in their life, they've repented, a genuine repentance. A house of prayer. One of the things that there are a number of people doing, preparing themselves to be involved in helping people see bondages in their life broken. And what they'll do, ultimately, when they're qualified, have finished the course, is they'll, they're looking for people to pray with. To lead in prayers of repentance and prayers of renouncing and prayers resulting in freedom, resulting in liberty. It's a, house, it's a perfectly legitimate thing to take place in a house of God, which is to be a house of prayer. Acts 8.24, then Simon answered, so he, he was challenged by Peter, and this was his answer back. Then Simon answered and said, pray to the Lord for me that none of the things which you have spoken may come upon me. So I've labeled this, 824, prayer for intercession, to appeal to another. So you realize you're in trouble. You realize you should be taken to the woodshed. It's a good thing to come to church. Pull somebody aside. Say, look, hey, uh, God should take me to the woodshed. Would you pray for me? Would you make an appeal for me? This is what I've done. I'm wrong. This is what I've done. Now, we don't do that in church because once we accept Christ and, uh, you know, we tell our testimonies of all the bad things we did, then we're real scared of telling people we've messed up. Do you understand? Because, well, we're supposed to have everything worked out. How many in this room are hitting every single cylinder perfectly every moment of every day at this time in your lifetime? If you'll stand up. I've got to sit down. <laughs> Okay. I'm not among those st standing. Well, I thought you were. You're in the wrong place. I'm not sure you'll find one, but you're in the wrong place. Prayer for intercession. So that should be a house of prayer. It's a place where people pray for others. And if you know you need prayer, help me. I've, I've really messed up here. 
appeal for prayer. Acts 9, 11. So the Lord said to him, Saul, he was traveling, he had papers, he was going to uh, throw more people in prison, presumably have them killed for, their, uh, for accepting Christ. He was very uh, religious Pharisee. And the, Jesus appeared to him, asked him why he was, uh, why he was causing such trouble, why he was uh, bringing such uh, attack against Christ. And Christ labeled it to, that you're doing this to me. And verse 9-11, so, uh, so he went to Saul. He, the Lord said to him, he's speaking to Ananias. Saul said, what do you want me to do? Go into this city, so Damascus. He was on his way to Damascus. So he goes in there. Three days later, he, God puts his finger on, speaks to another disciple, Ananias. And he said, arise and go to the street called Straight and inquire at the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he is praying. It's an interesting declaration. He's praying. He had just come to Christ, and you could say, I've just come to Christ. You know, how long do you have to be, you know, in a church, in the church, the church, the Lord's church, a house of prayer? How long do you have to be there before you can pray? Interesting, this was three days into Saul's, to become Paul, in Saul's journey. And the way he was described by the Lord to Ananias, he's praying. So I've labeled this in chapter 9, verse 11, prayer, an indicator of a changed heart. It doesn't mean it guarantees that's absolutely a changed heart because, see, they've prayed. I I understand that. But in this instance, that is what was told to Ananias to settle his fears. Look, he's praying. It's foundational. Prayer is foundational. Acts 9.40. But Peter put them out. So Peter continued on his journey. He went from there and he heard of a woman named Dorcas uh, who was uh, very well respected, and she died. And uh, they sent for Peter in another city, and he came, and um, they asked him, they showed him all the garments that Dorcas has made, and they said, would you, uh, you know, would you pray for her? So this is the response, Acts 9, 40. But Peter put them all out and knelt down and prayed. And turning to the body, he said, Tabitha, arise. And she opened her eyes, and when she saw Peter... She sat up. How fundamental it was in the approach of this, a man trained by Jesus. He could say, oh, I, you know, I remember when I was walking into the temple and uh, someone wanted some alms and I just looked to him and stretched forth my hand in the name of Jesus Christ. He was going to, it was the hour of prayer, he was going to pray. In this instance, it says he prayed and turning to the body, he said, Tabitha, arise. And she opened her eyes, and when she saw Peter, she sat up. I've labeled this prayer, seeking God's direction in personal ministry. You just, you're seeking God. You're saying, I'm dependent on you. Well, it's like every area of life, you can express that dependency. Yes. And so a church that's a house of prayer, it's a place that's filled with people who do what? Pray. Does it mean you're a 24-7 house of prayer? No, it doesn't mean that. Acts 10.2, this is an amazing passage. The gospel is now going to go to the Gentiles. So here's a Gentile centurion, a Roman uh, officer over a group of men. And uh, Acts 10.2 says, He was a devout man and one who feared God with all of his household, who gave alms generously to the people and prayed to God always. Different translations say regularly, continually. I have put here uh, 10.2, prayer, a mark of one seeking God. So if you're seeking God, that's a good thing to do. Here's a man who didn't have relationship with God, Hadn't accepted the claims of Jesus Christ, what he had done. But he was seeking God. He was doing good things. And then notice heaven's response, Acts 10.4. This is a magnificent. So the Acts 10.3 talks about an angel came and visited him. And when he observed him, this is when Cornelius observed the angel. And when he, Cornelius, observed the angel, he was afraid and said, What is it, Lord? So he, the angel, said to him, Your prayers and your alms have come up for a memorial 
before God. I'm telling you, that's tall cotton. That's my intention for what that box is at the back of the platform. In the early days of the time of visitation of the fragrance, the visitation of the fragrances of God, many of them were fragrances that could have been associated with the tabernacle and temple because of the nature of their smell, acacia, cedar, clearly, frankincense. So we brought items representative of what people brought to build the tabernacle, a place where God's presence was. So we've put them in there and have kept them in there as a memorial. It's a memorial. It's not the Ark of the Covenant. It's a memorial. This, your prayers and your alms have come up for a memorial before God. That is tall cotton. Could easily be stretching the point, but that $50 gift of that young junior high gal. But let's just say church was not a part of her life. That's the kind of thing that I think, you know, I'll bet you that falls in that category. A memorial before God. He takes note. So I call this how God views prayers. He takes note. Boy, that's tall. Acts 10, 9. The next day, as they went on their journey and drew near the city, so Peter's being drawn into this story. And the next day, as they went on their journey and drew near the city, Peter went up on the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. It was just a part of his life. The third hour and the ninth hour were the hours of prayer. Nine o'clock and three o'clock in the afternoon. This means it's noon starts at 6 a.m. in the morning. This means it's noon. So the sixth hour, it was noon. He went up on the housetop to pray. And I've labeled this 10-9, continuing in regular prayer. It was just a part of his life. That to me is part of uh, what my intentions are in the evening prayer, 9 to 10. Just, it's a part, we pray. Acts 12, 5. Peter was uh, therefore kept in prison. What happened is Herod had uh, taken James, the brother of John, and he saw that that pleased the Jews and he killed him, had him killed by the sword, and that seemed to please them, so he had Peter taken into captivity. At least that's the text in Acts chapter 12. He had Peter taken into captivity, and so here Peter was in jail. James had been killed. One of the disciples of Jesus, Peter's in jail. The early church is really shook, understandably. Peter was therefore kept in prison, but constant prayer was offered to God for him by the church. It's a house of prayer. I have put this, labeled this, corporate prayer in times of crisis. In this instance, it was for Peter. Through the years, we have seen some remarkable times of corporate gatherings where we were in one accord for various different things and saw remarkable good come from it. Acts 13.2 Then having fasted and prayed and laid hands on them, they sent them away. So these are people who have been commissioned into uh, a journey, a missionary journey. And so when they gathered, they they had a job, they had a responsibility. And so it's a great thing. So in your home, you're you're assigning a responsibility to your child. And so this is a new job that they're going to get. Here's a suggestion. Pray for them. Or as I said, they're having birthdays or it's a special occasion or so on. And you want, you want it to be marked, you use that as an opportunity to pray for them. Or as receiving new members, you use that as an opportunity to corporate, because you're saying, God, we're asking you to do these things. Or are you releasing people into ministry to pray for them? I, I have labeled this uh, 13.3, prayer and fasting, commissioning, first missionary journey. Prayer and fasting linked together. We'll say more about that in days to come. So, here we go. Acts 14, 23. So when they had appointed elders in every church 
and prayed with fasting. They commended them to the Lord in whom they had believed. That's such an elegant description of what they're doing. You're giving them responsibility. They were, had spiritual leadership responsibility in the local churches that they had established. But what they were really doing and prayer, they were, they, were, they were appealing to the Lord, seeking Him, but they were also commending them. And they commended them to the Lord in whom they had believed. What does a house of prayer really mean? It means people who are dependent on God. So you can live life doing it your way. Or we can live life that we take the opportunities, the occasions, to demonstrate to our own selves, to the kingdom of God, we are looking to you. We are dependent on you. And in that sense, the book of Acts is a wonderful litany of all the kinds of things that they prayed for. 1423, prayer and fasting to appoint and commend to the Lord. You can do that in your own lives, in your home, at work. Acts 16, 13. And on the Sabbath day, we went out of the city. They were in one of their missionary journeys. We went out of the city to the, to the riverside where prayer was customarily made. And we sat down and we spoke to the women who met there. So I've labeled this Acts 16, 13. There were recognized places of prayer. Yes, there are times that your closet is the right place to play, pray. And yes, I believe recognized places of prayer, Paul went to them. And he was proclaiming Christ there. His intention was to proclaim Christ. I've labeled this recognized places of prayer. I would that this would be known as a recognized place. People come, you know, I had need. That, those people will pray for you. They'll pray for you. I love a revelatory-based intercessory. I mean, this is what I believe. Because in prophecy, the secrets of somebody's heart are supposed to be being revealed. What is supposed to take place in a local church is the revelatory flow such that people will say, God is here. And the secrets of their heart will be revealed. And falling down on their face, they're going to turn to him. That is so appealing to me. Well, it's risky. So? Prayer. It's, kind of, it's like the currency of the kingdom. Recognize places of prayer. Acts 16, 16. Now, it happened as they went to prayer. So, the point is, they were going to prayer. They were on a missionary journey. They were, they were doing it. They were doing the works. They were doing the stuff. They were appointing elders. And, but regular prayer was just a part of their life. So it slipped in in that statement. It wasn't, well, we're so busy, we don't have time to pray. And now it happened as they went to prayer that a certain slave girl possessed with a spirit of divination, and I believe that's the kind of thing that I felt like God prompted me with this morning no, it was weeks ago, almost four weeks ago. I just felt a prompting. I think we're being hindered by a curse. And I, th I don't know what the curse is. I just think we're being hindered by a curse. And we're bumping into, moving into the next realm, dimension, period, whatever it is that God has for us. And we're being resisted. And then somebody just called me out of the blue several days later. And knew nothing about it and said, I believe that we're being, uh, a, a curse has been launched against us and I think it's a curse of witchcraft. And uh, I believe the, uh, the remedy, Katie Sousa is the one that I first learned it from, uh, Job 38, the, the warehouses, the storehouses, the treasure chambers of snow and hail that God has reserved for the Bay of Battle trouble. I think... Ought to call for snow. So we did that as a part of the corporate prayer time this morning. It was last week in early morning prayer, another person felt like they saw an old fence, an old iron fence, and snow piled up against both sides of it, and feeling like God was saying, prayer in the Spirit will cause that gate to open. 
And they had no knowledge of any of the things that I have just said before. So they were going to pray. They were going on their journey. And a gal with a spirit of divination. This was not good. This was not a messenger from God. That a certain slave girl possessed with a spirit of divination met us who brought her masters much profit by fortune telling. These are men of God. She was making those kind of statements. I have labeled this 16. Prayer was a regular part of life wherever. They were on a missionary journey. It was just a regular part of their life. What is a house of prayer? It's a place where people are who are dependent on God. How is prayer going to be expressed over what circumstances? I believe it's a textbook, the book of Acts. Acts 16.25, but at midnight, so they got cast in jail because the owners, the, the, the guys who were using this gal for profit, they got mad, they went to the city, they were in a foreign city, got them thrown in jail. So here's Paul and Silas, Lord, um, I have in me what they had in them, and I'm not there where they are, and I ask for the grace to be where they were. This is how they responded. They're in jail in a foreign city. But at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. And the prisoners were listening to them. They were praying and singing. I know many times at midnight when I've been in very difficult... I've never been in that difficult a circle. There weren't too many songs that I was singing. But at midnight, what were they doing? They were praying and singing hymns to God. So in the dark hours, that's a valid thing to do. What did the disciples who were trained by Jesus, what had they learned to do as expressed in the, ter- in the story of that early journey? They were singing hymns to God. The prisoners were listening to them. I've called this, when in trouble, they prayed. Everybody read that with me, please. When in trouble, they prayed. So here we go, Acts 21, 5. And when they had come to the end of those days, we departed. So Paul was, this was at Ephesus, and he was telling them, I'm not going to be here anymore. And uh, when we'd come to the end of those days, we departed and went on our way, and they all accompanied us, and we knelt down on the shore, and what? And prayed. That can be expressed. So you have people, uh, you know, friends who are moving to another place. And you're saying goodbye to them. I know we stay in touch through Facebook and Twitter and cell phones and iPads and iPods and whatever I stuff we use. I know. It's a great time to pray. They knelt down on the shore and prayed. What were they doing? They were expressing their dependency on God. What is a house of prayer? It's a place where people pray. They express their dependency. It's not, that's all they do. All they do is they gather 24 hours a day. That's all they do is pray. There are places God calls to do that. But a local church, you live the life of a church. You care for people. You tend to people. You have responsibilities. You have leadership. You have ministries. You're nurturing people. And we knelt down on the shore and prayed. I label this pray when leaving, when somebody's leaving. When your kids are going off to school, pray for them. Acts twenty two seventeen. Now it happened when I returned to Jerusalem and was praying in the temple. And I was in a trance. Paul saying this. And God was warning him about what was to come. Notice what he was doing. He returned to Jerusalem. He went to the temple to pray. Prayer was a regular part of their lives. What were they doing by that? They were expressing They're not living an independent life. They're living dependent on the Lord. It's a fascinating statement. Embodied within that, I was praying, he was praying in the temple. And he had a trance. I've labeled it 2217, Paul consistently prayed. Uh, Acts 27, 29. Then fearing lest we should be, uh, so he was on his way to Rome, the ship got Terrible storm. He, this was sort of his last journey. Uh, then fearing lest we should run aground on the rocks, they dropped our four anchors from the stern and they prayed for day to come. I've labeled this not pray when de- desperate. It's always a good thing to pray. You're desperate. That's a good time to pray. I like the picture of they dropped four anchors 
is a picture. Okay, Lord, here I am. Here I stand. I've dropped all the anchors. I'm waiting on you. If I'm going to get redemption, it's going to come from you. That's a reflection of the heart, I believe, of the house of prayer. Not how much money can I make on this sheep that I'm selling to this guy. Not how cheap a price can I buy that dove. Not how much money am I going to get on this money exchange. Place of dependency on God. Acts 28.8, and it happened that the father of Publius lay sick. So that's when they, the shipwreck came and they all got to shore and they built a fire and Paul was warming his hands on the fire. A snake jumped out of the fire, bit him. Everybody watching for him to die because it was a very poisonous snake. He shook it off in the fire. He didn't die. And then he learned that the father of, and it happened that the father of Publius uh, he was a, a leader, lay sick of a fever and dysentery, and Paul went into him and prayed, and he laid his hands on him, and he healed him. And I've labeled this 28.8. When ministering to the sick, pray. That's going through the book of Acts in all the different ways, occasions, that they prayed. I believe God's called us to be a house of prayer, but I think that's true of any church. But what's it going to, what's it to look like? I think it looks like that. People involved in ministry, following the direction of the Lord, caring for people, leading, all of those dimensions, but doing it with a real dependency on God. You can do that. When you're leaving, you pray. You can express those things because this is to be a house of prayer. This temple. Because this is the dwelling place of the Lord. This is to be a house of prayer. I think of so many times that I've done that when those kinds of different occasions came and I've prayed. I can sadly think of so many times that I didn't. And I wished I had. So I'm committing the Lord that I'm just asking for the grace to say yes to every prompting of yours to pray. Could you say yes to that? I'm asking, I'm saying yes. I'm asking for the grace to pray at every prompting that comes from you. I'm asking for the grace to say yes to every prompting of you to pray. I think that includes, for me, that's Walmart, Food City, Kroger, wherever. Well, Lowe's, you know, I pro probably greater chance you'll see me at Lowe's than Food City. <laughs> including Lowe's, including Lowe's. And here. Be attentive to people. If somebody, if you're talking to somebody here and you're, they said, boy, it's been a difficult week. Take that as a clue from a beloved friend. Let's say that you've gone to church with for many years. Pray for them. You meet somebody new who comes to church. You want to shock people. You meet them, they're new. You just said, hey, my name is, I'm so glad to see you. You know, can I just bless you in prayer? I'm not talking about a formula. That would be so great if someone came. I came to that church and five different people prayed for me. And I, that was the first time I've been there. Good. Hope it's ten next time. It's just a house of prayer. If you'll bow your heads with me. Father, we would be who you have created us to be. Fully. And I ask that you would give us the kind of heart that you've trumpeted before us of this little gal and her gift. That that kind of heart, you would grant that to us. Thank you for everybody in the room. Some are suffering right now. Some are at a peak of wonderful. Some in great turmoil, Lord. Some... Things are going so well. Some certain, some 
don't know what to do, what decision to make. There's so many different. You're the answer for everyone. And as a pastor, Lord, I bless your people. In the name of Jesus, I bless them. And if you're able, everybody said, amen.